So today we have a great, uh, I have a great pleasure of introducing Sanjay Sarma. Uh, you can read his bio, I'm, so I'm not going to go through that, but I'm going to tell you a little story. He is one of the reasons, probably the reason that you are all here. Uh, about two years ago, uh, when one of my colleagues actually challenged me to think about Beaverworks like model for the students who's not at MIT. Right. So why, wouldn't, why couldn't we make that opportunity available to more students? So I thought about that challenge, and I came up with this model. And as soon as I had this idea, the first person I called and on Saturday morning was Sanjay Sarma, because he's my mentor. And I asked Sanjay, Sanjay, I have this idea. What do you think? And then about 10 minutes later, Sanjay said, just do it. And that's why we started the program, and that's why we are here. He's been a great fan, great supporter, and great mentor to me. So with that, we, you know the routine, right? So we're going to say, in, on my count of three, we're going to say, good morning, Professor Sarma. OK? One, two, three. Good morning, Professor Sarma. Thank you very much. That was very kind. I have to say that inside Bob is a tiny nuclear plant. I kid you not, seriously. Okay. And what Bob and John have done is absolutely spectacular. We're very excited. Welcome to MIT. I'm glad you guys are having a great time. Please don't get lost. Okay. We might find you like a year later a little hungry. We don't want that to happen. All right. So let's get going. Um, I'm going to talk about learning science, but I'm going to try and practice what I preach. And the first thing I'd like to say is that lectures sort of don't work. So let me ask you by taking a, a little toll, a little poll toll. Uh, how many of you have used Khan Academy? Wow, pretty much everyone. Who has not used Khan Academy? Very small number. OK. Dimitri, we need to fix that, man. All right, I got to know three people here, and a fourth guy whose name I don't remember. No, I'm just kidding. I don't remember your name. Rishi. All right. So why does Khan Academy work? Yes. Are you the lady I ran into yeah. in the corridor? In the corridor? Yeah, go ahead. Um, she tried to persuade me that I should not talk about learning science, but talk about relationships. Give relationship advice. I refused. Just kidding, go ahead. That's no. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, so I usually use Khan Academy when I sit through a lecturing class, and my teacher explained it kind of in a confusing way and then didn't clarify it very well. And I can go kind of at my own pace and go to individual topics and understand it. So you said several things. He explains it well, but there's an MIT alum, you know that, right? He has three degrees from MIT. Probably took a lecture right here, actually. Uh, number one, he explains well. Number two, you can go at your own pace, right? And you had a third thing there. You said that. Oh, it's there, all the videos are kind of broken up by topics. It's modular. Yeah. It's modular. It's broken up into topics, right? Anyone else? Yep. Uh huh. There's practice. You actually do stuff. Okay, excellent, ma'am. Oh, I was just gonna say yeah, practice. practice. Yeah. Free. You can't argue with that. It probably gives you. It lets you visualize what you're learning. Okay. Anyone else? Yep. Uh, so the is you can watch the same video today, next week, in a month. That's right. Unlike professors, Khan Academy is rewindable. Um, in lectures, if you just miss something, you kind of get lost, and you just like the rest of the lecture, you're kind of lost. But here, you can just replay sections of the videos and then slow down and like just take it at your own pace. And that way, you don't miss anything because you can just rewind it. Excellent. What else? Anything else? Any other insights? Yep. There's a lot of like, applications or examples that you use. Aha, real world instantiations, right? You also can ask uh, people questions and they still can. Feedback. And there's a whole bunch of people you can ask. Yep. Uh, I don't know if this works for you, for you guys, but you earn energy points and then you motivate me. The points motivate your gamification. Okay. If you feel comfortable with the topic, you can also skip ahead in lectures in the same way that you can slow it down. You can slow it down. All right. I'll speed it up. Yeah. How many of you speed it up? 
That's what I figured. All right. How many of you have used Quizlet? By the way, he's an MIT alum. God herself is an MIT alum. <laughs> Why does Quizlet work? Because like, uh, they have different games. So like, what I do is I, uh, I play different games. Like, uh, don't worry if it's spelled like, uh, say the definition of the word based on which one's coming at you. So like, it makes it more fun, I guess. So it's gamified. There's actually something subtle in there, which I'll come to. Yep. They let you personalize your own quizzes or flashcards, but they also let you access Right, so it's peer-to-peer -peer and you can, you can personalize it. Yep. You know how Quizlet is founded, by the way? This um, Andrew was in his, at home, and he used to make flashcards, and he said, ah, let's just turn it to a program. Boom, Quizlet was formed. You know, 25% of high school students in America use Quizlet. So here's a little lesson. If you have a good idea, if you think it's a good idea and your friends think it's a good idea, there's a fair chance that could be a huge thing. Ideas like babies, don't kill them when they're babies, okay? Yeah. What I mean by that is they're very delicate and you need to give them love. Don't, I didn't mean to say you didn't kill babies, yeah. When you have an idea, it's very delicate, you need to give it a lot of love and give it a chance at survival, okay? It not only helps you learn, but it helps you simulate the testing environment so you can kind of basically test yourself in advance before a test. So, like, all kind of having helps you learn. Like, this helps you, like, get good at testing. Excellent. Uh, it's on mobile as well as being online, so it's like okay. multi mobile. Yeah, it's incredibly accessible. Right, by the way, he's going after speech, I think, next. Yep. <laughs> you care about the environment, okay. Uh, the UIs are accessible, so you can like, send it to other people even if they're not very like, tech savvy and they can like, just use it without like, having to like, read the instruction in the So it's web, it's digital friendly, yep. Um, so in the flashcard version, you can like push into stuff that you can get it wrong, so you're up to Uh-huh. That is called, well, hold that thought. Remind me if I don't come to that, okay? What's your name? Nithya. Nithya. Um, and also, you can make it so that it speaks the words. You can be learning. Yes, to yeah, that's the speech thing he was working on. So it also you can hear it. You can sound it out. Uh, you don't memorize what words are what based on. Say it again. You don't memorize what the words are based on the things in the corner of the card. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you do? <laughs> Anyone else? You yeah. can also have images. With that's great. You can associate data across m m media types, right? Excellent. So you can actually elaborate, yeah. right? Different vocabulary and definitions you can use as a reinforcement tool. So I can use a Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And like in addition to the printing now, you can actually print out your own flashcards. So it's not just digital; it's also. You can also make it physical, right? One last comment. Yep. It remembers you. Yeah. It's personalized. Like, uh, if you keep missing one, like it organizes which one you constantly get and which ones like, you miss. So you can always like reiterate on the ones you keep missing, so like you can read some of the ones that are like that in your memory. It means like, it keeps track of your performance, yeah. Also, like when you're studying, it's kind of hard to like quantify how far you've gone, because when you have a one math problem, you can see, okay, I have three left. And usually things that with studying, but when you're going through flashcards, it like keeps track of how many you've done, how many you've gotten wrong, and like you can see exactly what your progress is, so it doesn't feel like you're just endlessly going through the, the motions. You can actually see like how much you've left, how much you've left. How much progress you made. So let's in the interest of this is excellent. Actually, this is great for me because I want to hear from you guys. <clears throat> you've actually hit on many of the fundamentals of learning science. Now here's the tragedy. Sal Khan wasn't a university professor. Sal Khan was not a teacher. Andrew Sutherland, the founder of Quizlet, was not a professor. He was not a teacher. Would you say these are very important to your learning? Quizlet, Khan Academy, and all the other stuff? But they didn't come from us. Isn't that strange? It's very strange. Why is that? So let me give you the history. The modern education system as we know it today the classroom, this, who invented it? 
Russians? <laughs> Soviets, no, I'm just kidding. Who invented it? Who? Ford. Ford. No, he invented the assembly line. But, 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 but there's a connection. Let me explain. You can't blame the British for everything, man. <laughs> <laughs> but you're on the right track. Let me explain. Here's the deal. <clears throat> the modern education system, the way we educate today, you see, in in the in early Europe, in early Asia, in Africa, Arab, we don't know much about American history, uh, Native American history, but certainly in the history that we know a lot about, we know that learning occurred by apprenticeship. So you, you apprenticed with someone, right? So if you want to be a great sculptor, Michelangelo, you apprenticed with Michelangelo and you became like Michelangelo, right? That's the Renaissance period. In fact, there's a, if you're ever interested in it, there are books about it. But then what happened around 1800, that time frame is many things converged around the world. One was the Industrial Revolution. You needed to get all these villagers to learn how to operate machine tools and things like that. Then there were wars, and you needed a lot of engineering actually comes from military science, right? You had to build guns and you know, get the trajectory right so that it landed, the projectile landed in the right place. And the third thing that happened, so one was military, one was uh, the Industrial Revolution. The third was Europe had all these colonies there to manage, like America. Well, by the 1800, America was not. But the rest of the world, right? the country I grew up in, India, for example. Now, for all those things, you needed people who could do some math, who could follow orders, but were not so smart that they would question them. So inspired by uh, the Industrial Revolution, the assembly line came 100 years later, but similar thoughts. We invented the classroom. And there's a fundamental assumption in the way we teach today. The assumption is that the professor has a pen in his or her hand. And the student is a sheet of paper. And I'm going to write in your head. Now, do you think that's right or wrong? You're outraged, but it is absolutely that's the assumption, and it is wrong. So what do you think the right model is? Yep? I don't think it should just be the teacher writing the student, rather a two-way sort of thing where the teacher as well learns from the students. Also okay, so maybe the teacher should learn from the students, as I tried to do from you just now and did. Yep? Instead of the teacher just writing on the screen, Okay, exploration, very good. Hold that thought. It's amazing. You actually hit, you've sort of hit all the points I'm going to make. This is terrific. Yep? Let me offer you a model. And this is actually based somewhat in science. The model is you are not sheets of paper that I'm writing on, you are creating a model of the world, you are building knowledge you are building an image of the world and how it should operate, right? And I am simply feeding that plant. Do you understand? And it turns out that's what all the science tells us is true. What the science tells us is every one of us has this growing model. Little children, in fact, there's a great book about it called The Scientist in the Crib. Little children, you know, my nephew was visiting the other day. He got his hands on a wine glass. He took it and he smashed it, okay? I had to, for about, what's it, 10 seconds? I saw red. And then I had to th remind myself that what the child was doing was building a model of the world. A, glass breaks. B, it makes Uncle Sanjay really mad. Don't do it again, <laughs> right? What we do, is we form models of the world. And the best thing a professor can do, or a teacher can do, is feed that model. But you will formulate that model at your pace, in the order that works for you, right? Affected by your interests, by your circumstances, and we need to work around you to feed the model. But that was very inconvenient, 
when you had to train people in the Industrial Revolution to go around the factories, operate the guns, or become clerks around the, around the world. So we decided not to do it. Also, we didn't know any better. And that's the model that the education system today is based on. So let me tell you what the right model is. The model is what I just described. Think of it like this. First of all, how long do you think you can pay attention, by the way? Be honest. How long? OK, five minutes. So raise your hands if you think it's five minutes. Don't be, don't be embarrassed. 10 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay, it turns out most of us can pay attention around 10 minutes. Okay. So turn, the way to think about it is your computers, many of you don't have hard drives anymore, your computer has a hard drive and RAM, right? What happens if there's very little RAM? You can't go very fast, right? Even if you have a gigantic hard drive, right? So our memory is actually two, we have two forms of memory. We have RAM, it's called short-term memory. And we actually have gigantic hard drives. But the short-term memory is only about 10 minutes. So when you learn stuff, you can sort of learn for about 10 minutes. That's why I'm interrupting my presentation and you know, trying to make it interactive, right, to give you a little break. Now, at the end of 10 minutes, you think you're learning, but actually, you're becoming familiar, but you're not learning. It's false learning. Okay? But it's inconvenient, so we choose to ignore it. Because after all, it's easier to assume your sheets of paper that the professor can just write on. So at the end of 10 minutes, what should you do? 10 minutes, your brain's full. What should you do? OK, let me give you some options. Let's A, take a break, drink some water. B, take a nap. C, sing. D, talk about something completely different. What do you think? B. All of the above? B. All of the above? Sing, sing? No. Turns out the right answer is, at the end of 10 minutes, what you should do, I'm going to do it now because I've been talking 20 minutes, but I had breaks, is stop and ask individual students, the individual students formulating models of the world with the stuff they consume for 10 minutes, right? Questions about what they just learned. You know why? Because it turns out, that's, by the way, that's a, it's, a, it's an effect we know very well. It's called the testing effect or the retrieval effect. The act of retrieving stuff from your short-term memory organizes it and promotes a transfer to long-term memory. It's called the retrieval effect. So here's what I want you to do. I want, we'll stop now. I want each of you to turn to a neighbor and ask them a question as if you're setting an exam. There's no exam here, right? This is just friendly questioning. Ask your neighbor or neighbors a question about something I've just said and have them answer it and then flip and do it again. All right, maybe Dimitri and Amir, you can do it. All right, go. <clears throat> Okay, flip. The Oscar gets asked. Go. Okay, stop. Stop. Let's get some uh, examples of questions. Who asked a, can you volunteer a question you asked? <laughs> That's good. That's factual information. Anyone else? Volunteers? Yeah. <laughs> what? Why should you control ideas? ideas? That's good. Because they're babies and you need to treat them with love and attention. Anyone? Anyone else? Yeah? Um, what did you ask? What's the role of the teacher and the student's learning? 
Excellent. Now, here's the deal. What you just did was the retrieval effect. The problem is, it sounds like testing, doesn't it? Yeah. But actually, it turns out, we use testing almost in a punitive way. We use testing to see how well you learned. But testing used constructively in a friendly way. That's called formative testing as opposed to summative testing. Summative testing is to give you a grade. You got a B, Amir, right? OK, that's summative testing. Formative testing is when you ask questions to probe your short-term memory with no consequences. It turns out to be a fundamental, powerful, explosively effective way to learn. And who got that? Sal Khan got it. Quizlet got it. Do you get that in your classrooms? You sort of don't. Which is, the why you, which is the reason why you guys love Khan Academy. The other reason you love Khan Academy is because the videos are short, right? And if you don't understand something, when the question is asked, you can go review it. Right? So it maps, it matches up with the learning science. It's quite amazing, actually. Right? Okay, here's another one. What happens after 10 minutes if I kept going? What do you think? Come on, be honest. What happens if I keep going after 10 minutes? Yep. Back there. Okay, you start forgetting. What do you start thinking about? Yes. No, no, you, then the green shirt, yeah. Um, well, first you, you lose pieces of what you remember, which mm -hmm. like, harms your understanding of the entire thing as a whole, but also you, your mind just starts drifting. Ah, yes. Your mind starts drifting. How many of you agree your mind starts drifting? Do you feel bad when that happens? A little bit, right? Come on, come on. You feel bad, right? You feel like it shouldn't happen, right? Do you know, did, did, did you know that there's actually a technical term for that? You know what the technical term for that is? Sup you're surprisingly close. I'll let one of you, oh, you have your iPad on? It's okay, turn it on. For one minute, go to scholar.google.com. Okay. The term for that, are you up at scholar.google.com? The term for that is mind wandering. That is quite literally the technical term for it. Okay, the, who, the dude who thought this up is like, we can call it you know, some complex Greek or Latin name. Well, let's just call it mind wandering. It turns out that after 10 minutes, your brain fills up, your mind wander. Okay? Are we at scholar.google.com? Search for mind wandering space and F, F, the letter F, M, R, I. Yeah, functional MRI. They can actually see inside the brain when people's brains mind wander. You can actually see when you're focusing your prefrontal cortex which most of you, because you're still teenagers, is still growing in. It will grow in eventually, okay? You won't get lost, you know, and John won't have to come running after you. It takes about five years, all right? The prefrontal cortex, that is the boss, right? So when you're not mind wandering, the boss is in charge. It's here, literally, right? And you're focused. But after 10 minutes, if you're seeing the functional MRI, you can see Stuff just bouncing around the brain. It goes all haywire. Happens after 10, 10, 10 to 12 minutes of, edu of, uh, of learning. So did you find a paper on it? So here, check this out. First paper that came up. Experience sampling during functional MRI reveals default network and executive system contributions to mind wandering. Let me interpret that for you. What they did was they did an experiment with students. They stuck them in, a in an MRI machine. Basically, a functional MRI is an MRI machine. They can look inside the brain. The MRI machine can see which part of the brain is consuming more oxygen. And that's, where you're fo that's the part of the brain that's sort of active. You want this to be active, the prefrontal cortex. After about 10 minutes, what they're saying is the default network, it's like the, like the bus in your computer. It's like a network in a computer. It, everything lights up. That's what they're saying. And the executive system, which is this guy, which should be the boss, 
has lost control and it leads to mind wandering. That's the first paper that came up. I didn't set it up, he just found it, right? Just to show you that that is the technical term. By the way, let me just tell you, do you think mind wandering is good or bad? Come on, make up your mind. All in favor? All opposed? Okay, let me just tell you the answer. Okay. Mind wandering, look, 5,000 years ago we were all farmers. Did you have to sit in a classroom for 45 minutes and learn, learn something? No. First of all, this whole thing is a little unnatural. We didn't evolve for this. This is only in the last 100 years. You know, 400 years ago, most of my none of us, our ancestors, went to college, right? Because there were very few colleges, right? So this is unnatural. So don't feel embarrassed about it. This is what it is. So it turns out, mind wandering is not such a bad thing, because it makes us creative. It connects the dots. The brain's connecting the dots. Okay? It's assimilating and digesting the information. That's why it's going all over the place. It's doing some other stuff that needs to be done. It's relaxing. Okay, now, it is bad in a couple of respects. One, when you do want to focus on something, it becomes a problem. By the way, this isn't learning. When you're doing something fun like playing a game, right, or programming or doing something creative, mind wandering gets deferred. This is when I'm shoving stuff at you. That's when after 10 minutes, mind wandering kicks in. If you're doing something, when it's output oriented, you can keep going and that's called flow. You understand? So there's only when I'm peppering you with stuff. So mind wandering can be inconvenient. By the way, uncontrolled mind wandering can actually lead to depression. What's strange? The same thought sort of goes spinning. So mind wandering is also, if you can't control it. For some folks who can't control it, it's a problem. Do you know how to control mind wandering, by the way? You don't want to control it. Lecture should be 10 minutes, you should take a break. I should do retrieval or testing to promote it, and then I can start again. But if you did want to sort of control uncontrolled mind wandering, would you, do you know how you would do it? <laughs> mindfulness. Strangely, mindfulness is beginning to strangely, people are realizing it actually sort of works. You can also, see, you can do a search on that on say mindfulness, mind wandering, fMRI, you'll see it. They're finding that if you do some mindfulness, you can actually control uncontrolled mind wandering. But let's not fight it. The fact is, after 10 minutes, do testing. OK, here's another question for you. By the way, you're seeing why Khan Academy is so great, right? You're seeing why uh, Quizlet is so great. Mind wandering sometimes will set in three minutes, and you miss what the professor said. With Khan Academy, you can rewind it, right? So this is why that stuff is so great. I have one final comment and I'll stop in a minute. Um, <clears throat> so let's say you're learning something new like calculating the volume of a, you guys all know this, calculating the surface area of a cone and calculating at another surface area of a sphere. You guys know this, but let's say you were in, in, um, in middle school and you were learning this. So here's the question for you. Are you better off learning sphere, 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 cone, cone, cone? or sphere, cone, sphere, cone, sphere, cone? Okay, who is in fear of sphere, I, I can't believe I got you all to say sphere, cone, sphere, cone, sphere, cone, anyway. <laughs> who is in favor of sphere, cone, sphere, cone, sphere, cone? And who is in favor of sphere, 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 cone, cone, cone? It turns out sphere, cone, sphere, cone, sphere, cone. How is every textbook organized? Isn't that amazing? You know why sphere cone is better? Sort of. You're on the right track. Yep. You guys are on the right track, but you're not nearly there. Yep. There's an element of that. I'm going to ask one more person. Yep. That's all right. That's all correct. But I'm going to say one thing which will pull it all together. We learn by differences. When you switch, you go, oh, that's why the cone is different. You switch back, 
you go, oh, the sphere, pi, you know, four pi r squared. Then you switch back, right? It's one third, you know, pi r. So it's the contrast where we learn. The human sensory system is based on contrast. If I tell you, hey, um, what's the temperature? You can't really tell. But if I make it really cold, you'll notice it. You know what I mean? So we like change. It's like feeling the edge of something. This all feels the same. Oh, I feel the edge. Right? But every pedagogical, every learning experience is designed around doing the same thing. Okay? Isn't that interesting? I have one more example, and then I'm going to end with what you're doing today and what you're doing this week. Here's another one. So your kid sibling comes home from school. They've learned something, modular arithmetic. Okay? Teacher has 50 problems in modular arithmetic in her back pocket. Your sibling came home. Teacher got the first part, did 10 minute lectures, did testing after each. It's not testing to give a grade, it's so that you encourage learning. But now the teacher is wondering, what should I do with those 50? Should I give them tonight? Should I give them tomorrow after they sleep? When should I deploy them? What do you think the answer is? Before you sleep. Anyone else? Good. After a different lecture. After a different lecture? Should I tell the answer? The answer is? Never. <laughs> let's, let's say there were 50. Five the next day. Five the next week. Five the next month. Five the next year. OK? And you might say, what the hell is that? Where did that come from? Here's the deal. It turns out when you learn something, When you learn something, it's very fascinating. If you learn something, you forget it like this. But the best time to remind you is when you're about to forget it. It's very strange. You have to be on the verge of forgetting it. And if I remind you, then you'll go back up to 100% and you'll forget more slowly. And that has, that has to do with the, the, with the way neurons store memories. They can store memories in two ways. Short-term memories are formed by a liquid, a neurotransmitter between the neurons. Long-term memories are stored by the neuron dropping another synapse. And if you wait to just forget it, the brain says, oh, the liquid thing didn't work. You gotta drop another synapse. It's fascinating. How many of you are sports, how many of you are sports uh, types? Runners, rowers, etc. Do you know what interval training is? That's, what, that's the same thing, but for the human muscle. All these things, ladies and gentlemen, are very difficult to do in a classroom. So where digital education comes in, where Sal and Andrew Sutherland with Quizlet and everything we're trying to do at MIT is taking lectures out of the classroom and making them much more adaptable. So what do we want to do in the classroom? What do you think? Projects. What? Projects. Projects. So it turns out, yeah. Yes, exactly. It is, basically it is clarifying and executing and doing and solving. Because remember what I said, when you actually do something and go for a long time, it's called flow mode. We want to give at MIT our students the opportunity to be in full opportunity to be in full flow and do the learning beforehand, and then pull the learning back in the context of a project. Because the final comment is, when you learn something and you understand why you learned it, you remember it for the rest of your life. Okay, and that's what BeaverWorks is doing. That's what you're doing in these projects you have a unique opportunity to be the cutting edge of creativity in applying what you've learned. But remember everything else I've said to you, right? The way your brain works is not the way the education system today assumes it works. Don't feel bad if your mind wanders. Use other tools. Ask each other questions. Use Quizlet. Interleave 
spread and you'll have a great learning experience. Thanks very much, guys, and all the best for this. that all these techniques that I showed to you. So let me, let me draw something for you. <clears throat> so how many of you have seen a hot dog eating contest? OK. This is relevant, I assure you. Hold that thought. Do not throw up. This is time. This is the day of the exam. This is the beginning of your class. This is life afterwards. Okay? Sort of what I just explained to you, you can draw it in a different way. If you eat really, really, if you, if you learn very, 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 very fast, you will hit a high peak on the day of the exam. You'll get a good grade. You'll forget it very fast. If you eat slowly, if you learn slowly, that's the hot dog eating contest, right? What happens the next day? He's, yeah, he's throwing it up. Okay, he's not putting on weight. Right? Not that that's a good idea, but anyway, if you learn slowly, you actually don't get such a great grade if you apply all the techniques I showed you, but you remember it for the rest of your life. Our grading system rewards this, and it's very unfortunate in most systems, not at MIT. At MIT, we're trying to look for this because the project may take a long time. It's the staying power that gives you success, right? So in answer to your question, yeah, I have problems with our grading system. Okay. Other questions? Uh, how do you go about- Rishi. Rishi. Yeah. 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 <laughs> how do you go about convincing like all the teachers across the nation that this is like a- We'll do it. We'll do it, it'll take some time. We have a number of projects and we have online stuff and reaching students and we have alums who talk about it and you know, it'll take a long time. But you're the few, the proud, the chosen, so you, you should know. Okay, but it'll take a long time, right? Uh, um, this may be sort of like an add-on to the question, but what are your thoughts on a standardized testing? You know, I have mixed feelings about it. The fact of the matter is, standardized testing addresses a different issue than this issue. It's trying to establish, it's trying to make sure everyone's brought to a certain level and school districts don't completely drop the ball. So in my, what I'm saying is rather subtle. Standardized testing addresses a much more fundamental issue, which I think is important. So I'm not against standardized testing per se, right? How would you like to compare that to like, let's say, as opposed to standardized testing, project-based assessments? The problem is that when there's so much diversity among school districts, right, um, project-based testing, project-based testing works in small, like in, at MIT or in this group, right? But to create a project and have, it, you know, the project may be biased towards a, one gender and not the other, right? It may be biased towards someone who lives in a woody, you know, sort of a part, you know, where there's a lot of wood, as opposed to someone who lives in an arid area. You've got to be very careful with that stuff. So I don't, want to, oh, I don't want to exaggerate the power of it. I'm saying that for you as human beings, taken as a set of one, I'm giving you lessons. Treating the, the if when you look at the nation as a whole, so those things are important. You can't toss them out. Okay? Uh, yeah. Um, I was wondering, obviously, there's one problem with the test. Um, like what you suggest in terms of how teachers assess students? You know, the last thing I want to do here is somehow say the teachers are at fault. They're not. Okay, my mother was a teacher. And your teachers, I find that they don't get paid a lot. But they're loving and caring and, you know, this is not the teachers. It is the system. And the problem is an individual teacher can't just suddenly change everything. They're part of the system, right? So uh, some of the more, 
you know, if, especially in private schools, they have more resources, they can sort of play around with it a little bit. Uh, but you know, if we gave them the ability and we gave them a single message, gave them the time and the training and the equipment, we could do magic. And that's sort of what we're trying to do at MIT, sort of encourage that, okay? This is not about teachers. I, as I said, I'm a huge fan of the extraordinary uh, commitment um, and uh, hard work that teachers put in. The last thing I want to do is be, this is a system problem. This is the people who designed the system, right? Yeah. What's the number one thing that students like us can actually do? Do. Do. When you learn something, do it. You go to a classroom, take a pencil. You learn something in math, apply it. Solve problems. Ask each other. Question each other. Go to the web and find problems you can solve. The doing part is the important part. You understand? Now, you can't break up the lecture, right? Because you'll be accused of being disruptive, right? But, so you'll have to sort of live with it. But more and more teachers are realizing that you need to have in, you know, intercessions where you do things and take full advantage, okay? Question, question each other, have discussions, find groups, try and build something, just do. You know what I mean? Don't be passive. That's not what you would do. Give that my mental model you're building, give it a chance and let it flourish. Okay? All right, guys, I better run, but thank you very much. <laughs>